All right. Hello, everyone. So I'm Michael Chang. I am the director of North American Marketing here at Bluco, and I want to thank you all for joining this webinar. I know that um, there's probably still a lot of people jumping on. I see the uh, attendee list continuing to rise, uh, but in the interest of time, I will go ahead and get started. Um, so once again, thank you all for, for joining. Um, I wanted to quickly introduce everyone that's on the call here. We have a full pack team here to answer your questions, uh, go over new materials and new content, and of course, uh, dem demonstrate a little bit about uh, how to best utilize Bluco in your day-to-day -day practice. So first I'd like to introduce uh, Rachel and Kate who are on our customer support team. They are on, um, they'll be throughout the call answering questions. So if you see down below, there's a Q&A section and I already saw someone asking a question. Um, so they will be um, answering those questions live and uh, and uh, and populating it onto the screen. So if uh, you can follow the Q&A on the side to see if there's any questions that you have that are being answered in the Q&A section. If you have any, please type it into the Q&A. Um, and then one of the uh, customer support people will respond back to you. In addition, we also have Cameron Trotter, who is our uh, marketing manager, global marketing manager. Um, and uh, she will. Uh, she's the one that actually prepared all of these beautiful slides and content, uh, and is constantly uh, working on making sure uh, our our uh, our materials are being made available to you. So, if you have any uh, comments or questions for her regarding what types of materials would be helpful, please let her know. And then we also, of course, have Patrick and Kaylin, who are from our, our account management team. They will be talking a little bit more today uh, later on, but they. Um, really service all of our direct Gluco customers. So for those of you that are our, our direct Gluco customers, thank you very much for um, for your uh, for your loyalty. And of course, I'm sure you know some of the uh, account managers that uh, can communicate with you on a, on a you know, periodic basis. And then lastly, of course, we have our guest speaker, uh, Gary Shiner, who really doesn't need any introductions, uh, but as many of you guys are probably here because specifically of him, but he's been a, a great, um, supporter of Gluco, and we're very, very lucky to have him. Um, as you may likely know, he's a certified diabetes educator. He's the founder of Integrated Diabetes Services um, and uses Gluco in his uh, clinical practice. He's also, of course, the 2014 uh, Clinical Educator of the Year, uh, as well as an author and, and uh, presenter on many, many topics. And uh, we are, are very blessed to have his uh, presence here to sort of answer uh, lots of clinical questions about how best to utilize Gluco in your, uh, in your practice. Once again, as just a quick reminder, if you have any Q if you have any questions, please feel free to answer uh, post them in the Q and A section. I'm also going to launch a poll uh, right now to see what other future topics you may be interested. Uh, so at your leisure, please feel free to go into the poll section and uh, answer those those um, uh, answer those questions at your leisure. So with that, I will turn it over now to um, Kaylin to go through some of what's new with the Gluco product. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Sorry, the poll popped up. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today. As Michael said, I'm Kaylin Kelleher, and I'm the head of account management at Gluco. I am really excited to talk to you all a little bit about what's new with Gluco, as well as our commitment to secure data. So let's dive right in. As an overview, we will dig in, and then we'll dig into each of these a little bit deeper. We've added exciting weight tracking visualizations into the mobile app. You can now assign a care program during a patient account creation. And we are also continuing to expand our device compatibility with iPhone and Android. So first up, let's talk a little bit about weight visualization within the mobile app. If your patient has a smart scale like Withings or a Fitbit that they sync to the mobile app and they track their weight, you can now see that information right on the home screen and it can be found in the history list and the charts and graphs section as well. Depending on your patient settings and the area of the world, it would show up in the unit of measure that you are most comfortable with. As you can see from the images on the screen here, depending on the area of the app you're in, you're gonna see the most recent readings plus the highest and lowest weight on the home screen on the left, or on the right, there's an average in a given time period, which is in the charts and graphs section. All really exciting stuff. So moving on, if you are a Gluco Enterprise customer, you can now add a care program during the account creation process. 
This option will show up on the account creation page as you're moving through that workflow. Um, we're not going to get into specifics about care programs today, but if you are interested in learning more, you can visit our help center and search for care programs. And finally, we are continuing to expand our device compatibility on iOS and Android. All three of the devices that you see here are already supported on the glucotransmitter and the uploader. And now the Terumo Fit Smile and the iSense No Coding One Plus are available on Android. And the Acon On-Call SureSync is available on iOS as well. And keep checking back and keep attending webinars because we keep adding more devices often. Now, before we get into the actual demo piece, I'd like to chat a little bit about the value of security and what we're doing at Gluco to support keeping your data and your patient's data more secure. We're really proud at Gluco to have a strong commitment to security and protecting patient health data. We've worked really hard to, to achieve these rigorous industry-leading third-party certifications, such as High Trust, ISO, and SOC 2 certifications. Gluco's investment in security has really been a driving force in bringing Gluco Enterprise into many large enterprise, enterprise health organizations that have information security as a really top priority. Uh, with our commitment to security, you can count on secure EHR integrations that will simplify the workload on your healthcare administrators. And you can also count on a trusted partnership with Gluco and know that your patient's data is protected and secure from all those vulnerabilities that exist today. And if you are a Gluco Enterprise customer, you also have a couple other solutions available to you as well to help reduce that risk, adhere to compliance protocols, and really just help to keep sensitive data safe. We have two-factor authentication, which adds an extra layer of security and reduces risk of unauthorized access. We have a single sign-on option, which not only streamlines access to multiple systems, and it also enhances efficiency and will help to minimize password vulnerabilities. And coming soon, we have a new single logout function that will ensure that users in a shared workspace are signed out from all the active sessions when they log out of one session of Gluco. So if you're interested in any of these, we'd be happy to connect you to a Gluco rep to talk more about what that might look like for your organization. All right, and thank you so much for your time today. I'm really happy to introduce our demo team today. Once again, Patrick Watkins, one of our esteemed senior account managers working to help our customers be successful with Gluco, and Gary Shiner, a wonderful Gluco partner and diabetes educator who has been using Gluco in his practice for years. You'll be in good hands with them for this next piece of the demo. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Gary and Patrick. Thanks. Thank you, Caitlin. So, Gary, you're sharing the patient list here. Thanks. Would you mind scrolling up a little bit? For those not familiar with the patient list, what you're seeing here is the list of all of the patients in this particular Gluco account. So what you're seeing is a test account that we have here for demos like this. And you can see the most recent think date is one of the prominent columns. So we've got a patient in here who is uploaded as of today. Uh, to the right of that, you can see we have a flags column. To the right of that are some tags. And to the right of that are the care programs that Kaylin mentioned before. So any patient can be tagged with custom tags that you can make on the fly. You can tag them as the provider that can log into the account so that you can stratify your patients. And then very easily, Gary, if you wouldn't mind clicking on filter patients in the upper left there, these tags and flags can then be filtered. So you can search for specific patients based upon any of these various markers. As I mentioned, the tags can be created on the fly. We also have built-in tags like the pregnancy package. So you can see this red tag is showing that there's a patient who is in week 24 with two days uh, toward the due date. The flags, on the other hand, are generated based upon data that comes in. So we have some built into our population health module, but you can also create at-risk cohorts to find patients that you consider to be specifically uh, in need of being contacted. So you can cast a wide net, cast a narrow net, and then create a, a flag that goes along with that cohort so that any data that comes in will give you a visual indicator immediately of anything that you think is worthy of note. Okay, Gary, why don't you go to the Assigned Devices tab? 
And very briefly, I'll walk through a typical in-clinic process here. So if you can see me on my camera, I know I'm probably in a little square where you are, but I have a transmitter that, that you can get for your location that operates as a standalone piece of hardware to upload the many devices that are compatible with Gluco. So I'm just very briefly going to upload this Contour Next 1 blood glucose meter. As you can see on the screen, there are three devices that are still unassigned to patients and two that have been assigned. And as soon as I plug this in, I'm just going to plug into the USB port on the end of this BG meter and my transmitter lights up, recognizes that there's a device. It's gonna grab that data. Oh, sorry, it looks like I just rebooted by moving it. Apparently my power cord has got a little bit of a, a finicky connection. So it's gonna look for the network. So this may take a minute. So my apologies, but what will happen here is when this device gets uploaded, it's gonna show up in this unassigned section, just like these other devices. So you can see that the one touch ping meter, for example, uploaded at 11.51 a.m. The location that that was uploaded, so that was in an adult endo location. And it is suggesting that I assign it to a specific patient because the system has seen this device be assigned to that specific patient before. But you don't have to do that. If you do want to, just simply click on assign to Patrick Wilson there. Or you can choose to assign it to another patient. The devices below that, however, are new to the system and you see that it displays new device and the option then to the right is to assign. And by clicking on any of the assign options, it will open a search window where you can put in a first name, last name, and date of birth to search for a given patient. If the patient does exist, the system will give you uh, an option to assign it to that existing patient or even to create a new patient who may happen to have the same name and date of birth. From this page, you can also then go into the report creation or unassign a device if for some reason a device was mistakenly assigned to a patient, you can very easily do that. You can also filter on this page by any of the input methods. So in the filter by section, you can choose to narrow down to a device type or by an upload location, for example, that adult endo, as opposed to the primary care that has also uploaded today. You can filter to see more or less of what's happening on this page. So with that, I'll turn it over to Gary, and we can start looking at real patient data. All right, thanks, Patrick. Uh, efficiency is very, very important to me. You know, in order to run a successful practice, we have to be able to you know, maximize our productivity. But at the same time, we have to have enough information uh, in order to be able to manage our patients effectively. Uh, so that's one of the you know, things I, I like a lot about uh, about Gluco. I mean, it's very comprehensive. We can get data from so many different devices, but once that data is there, then what do you do? And uh, I'll take you through just an example of how, how I go through uh, a patient's data report in Gluco. Uh, because the system can uptake data from finger stick glucose meters, from CGM devices, from insulin pumps from automated insulin delivery systems. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to, to view information. You know, I'd say that the pinnacle is when we're using these new automated insulin delivery systems uh, to be able to get kind of integrate everything in one place, be able to see the sensor information and the glucose values, the carb entries, the insulin deliveries, uh, and be able to also add events you know, when patients are set up with Gluco, we, we always teach them how to use the app and how to enter uh, events like exercise because that doesn't show up in any other places. And when they enter those sort of things, it'll show up in the reports. So these are all fictitious patients, so don't worry about uh, confidentiality issues. But we're going to use uh, Nola Watkins as uh, the example in this case and uh, take a look at her data. And Nola happens to be uh, using one of the hybrid closed loop systems. So we'll be able to see a little of everything uh, in her report. So what, what shows up first is a, is a summary report. And what, I don't even look at that at first. I go right to devices. This is where I can verify that the patient settings are what, what I have in my EHR. You know, we keep track of the settings. 
So I'm going to click on the tandem pump and see what all the settings are. So we have uh, the basal settings that are set in the system. We have the insulin to carb ratios. We have the correction factors, the target glucose ranges. And if we go to device settings, we can also see what the duration of insulin is set for. So before I even get into uh, some of the other reports, I noticed this two hour active insulin time and I'm really yet to see anybody who's, who's even their rapid acting insulin that clears in two hours. So that there's a good chance that that could present a problem. You know, if the active insulin time is set too short, there's potential for a lot of stacking of insulins. The system's going to underestimate uh, insulin on board in that case. And when I see what the uh, other settings are, I see a basal pattern that has two peak times. There's an early, well, mid-morning peak. There's also a, a late evening peak. And uh, knowing the age of, of, the, of the patient would help because if it's a teenager, I, I would expect to see the evening peak. That's pretty common in people who are going through a lot of growth. If it's an adult, the morning peak is relatively common, but we don't usually see two separate peaks in someone's basal program. Uh, that typically does not work quite right. The insulin to carb ratio is the same all day. And in most patients on intensive insulin therapy, we do see variation in uh, insulin to carb ratios. For most people, they tend to be most aggressive in the morning and least aggressive in the middle of the day. So there's a potential to make improvements there. We see a correction factor that is the same throughout the day as well. Um, of 150, which is, is, is a very high correction factor. So unless this patient's on a very low dose of insulin, that correction factor might be set a little too high. And what that means is that uh, when they are high, they may not get quite enough to bring it down to normal. So from there, let's go back to that summary report. And there's a number of things we'll be able to see here. One thing I'm curious about is how much time they spend low, because that, that Duration of action, that two hours could present a problem. And right away, I see that 7% of their time is below 70. That's a lot. That's almost two hours a day in a state of hypoglycemia on average. That means if there's a day with no lows, the next day they're likely to be low for four hours. So that's quite a bit of hypoglycemia. Uh, we can customize the time interval Two weeks is a fairly common time interval to look at. There's been research that shows that the, the running average for two weeks tends to correlate very closely with the A1Cs that are taken at the end of that time. So it's a common time interval to use, but you do have the option of looking at longer time intervals or doing a custom time interval. So if you wanted to compare last month to this month, you can specify in the custom range the date you start and the date you finish. Uh, then I look at the time in range overall. Is it 64%? Obviously, this is a very important metric now. Time in range not only reflects the quality of someone's glucose management, it also correlates with the risk for long-term complications. With some great data presented at ADA this year on that very topic. Uh, and then I look over at the insulin utilization. So this person is using about 22 units of insulin per day. And those of you who, who understand how we calculate correction factors, that corresponds with a correction factor of somewhere around 80 or 90. Uh, so that correction factor we saw earlier that was 150, you know, that may need to be adjusted a little bit. And then I look at the proportion of basal and bolus. 46% basal, 54% bolus is, is typical. You know, unless somebody's on a super low carb diet, we usually see the basal being 40, 45% of their daily insulin needs and the bolus is usually around 55 or 60%. If the proportions are way off from that, it gives us some indication as to whether somebody is, is not getting enough basal or too much bolus, et cetera. Uh, and we scroll down, we get a couple of the reports. Uh, this is called the AGP report, which is sort of a summary sensor report. The, the heavy blue line reflects the average every five minute interval throughout the day. The thick blue 
area uh, captures the middle 50th percentile of data points. So if, if that thick blue area is stretching above the target zone, above 180 in this case, uh, that's a sign they're spending a lot of time in a hyperglycemic zone. And if it's dipping below 70 at any point, likewise, they're spending a lot of time below their zone. And then down here, I can see how much carb uh, they're averaging per day. At least that's what they're entering into their pump. There may be carbs that don't get entered, but at least it gives us some idea of whether this individual is on a super high or low carb diet. And that's helpful because if they are on a very low carb diet, it could skew this percentage of basal and bolus more towards the basal side. And if it's like most teenagers who are eating 300 grams of carb a day, it'll skew it more towards the bolus side. So at least it can provide us with some explanation for that. And because gluco can also sync with activity trackers, uh, we can see what the step counts would be. From here, uh, one of the reports I like to look at is under the heading of insights. Uh, insights provides us with some statistical reports about how glucose levels might vary by day of infusion set usage, or what happens when somebody is making their own temporary basal adjustments. We don't see temp basal adjustments that much anymore. Uh, with the hybrid closed loop systems, but with people on traditional pumps, they may be using them quite a bit. Uh, so this is only showing us the last 14 days. Let's look at 30 days. We'll get a little bit more useful uh, data. So this is showing that when NOLA changes their infusion set uh, on the third day, uh, their average glucose, it's around 150. What's interesting is that when they're going an extra day, their glucose on that last 12 hour period of the set usage actually comes down a little bit. So what I learned from this is that this person is not all that sensitive to having to change their site on that third day. If they do go a little bit longer, it's not that much of an issue. Other times I'll see cases where somebody who changes after that third day, the glucose just starts to go up exponentially. And that tells me, you know, we can't be wearing these sets longer than two days or three days or it's, or whatever the length might be. And can also provide justification to get insurance to cover uh, in more frequent infusion set or pod changes because we have evidence that the glucose is suffering when it's worn beyond a certain number of days. Uh, from here, I, I take a macro to micro approach. I look at a macro type of a graph like that, uh, uh, the AGP report. In my case, my favorite to look at is called an overlay. So this is the, under the heading of graphs. I click on overlay and it presents something called a spaghetti graph. You know, I would never ever look at 30 days at a time on a graph like this. I'll look at one week or maybe two weeks. It gives me a good overview of what kind of patterns are showing up. So I look at this and I say, you know, just in the last week, we've got a lot of hypoglycemia in the middle of the day. Uh, between 7 a.m. and 4 in the afternoon, there's, a, there's several uh, hypoglycemic episodes. There's also quite a few in the late evening. So when we go and look at more detail, we'll try to figure out why that's happening. This lets me evaluate the post-meal patterns. I can see what kind of peaks are taking place after meals. Is the blood sugar spiking very high or is it more stable after meals? And it, it appears to be kind of a mix in this case. So we might need to teach the patient a little bit about glycemic index, choosing foods that don't digest as quickly, or perhaps about bolus timing, making sure that they're getting their insulin at the appropriate time you know, before the food all starts to digest on them. Uh, we also have the option of looking at this graph in an AGP format like we saw before. But personally, I, I like the spaghetti graph format because it does allow me to see cause and effect relationships. So when somebody has a low, where do they wind up afterwards? Sometimes every low is followed by an extreme high, and I know they're either over-treating or rebounding from that low. Or we might see highs that wind up as lows. And that would mean that the correction factor may be a bit off. 
In this case, it's just the opposite. You know, we have correction boluses that aren't bringing the glucose down quite enough. And that's a sign that the correction factor might need some adjustment. Uh, so that's sort of the macro view. Uh, the log, not the log book, I'm sorry. Well, the log book is a useful report, I find, for people who are not using a CGM. It'll just list out the glucose values at meal times, and they're highlighted in green uh, when they're in the patient's target range. The carbs are in the gray boxes, and the bolus doses of insulin are in the white boxes underneath. So for somebody who's not on a CGM, this is a great report to look at. Uh, but I'm going to go back under graphs. To go from the macro to the micro, we go to the overview reports. Now, the first overview report is going to crush everything into one day. But if we click on the first day within that time interval, now we have what I call, this is the money report. This shows us all the details we need. We have the sensor tracing for the entire day. The purple bars represent bolus doses. And in this case, the little purple bars are automated correction boluses that the pump delivered. And there's a key at the bottom that lets you see what everything means in terms of its color. The carb entries are in blue in the boxes above the boluses. So I can see right here, we've got what might be a traditional meal or snack time, but you'll see there's no carb entry. So this person gave themselves a bolus, uh, presumably for something they ate, but it wasn't based on what, wasn't based exactly on what they ate. They just put a dose in. Anytime we see sharp upswings in the glucose with no bolus or carb entry, those are likely missed boluses. They just ate and didn't give insulin to eat it. Those are fairly easy to detect on these individual day reports. So just on this one day, I can see a low after breakfast. I can see a low after lunch. And I can see very high glucose in the evening with correction after correction after correction to try to bring that glucose back down. Down at the bottom of the graph, we can see the basal delivery. The red streaks represent times when the pump shut off the basal to help prevent hypoglycemia. Uh, otherwise, we see minute adjustments that are being made in the basal delivery. Now, we'll say that with the tandem pump, you can see all of the basal adjustment. If we looked at the same report for somebody using an Omnipod 5, we would not see the individual basal adjustments. We would just see overall whether they're using their standard basal rates or if the system has shut the basal off, or if it's maxed out on their basal delivery. Here, it's very easy to click one of the arrows up top, go to the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and so on. And so here, overnight, we had a case where the glucose was persistently high. The system kept ramping up the basal delivery to a pretty high level all night long, to the extent that they wound up in a state of hypoglycemia by morning. Uh, so that could mean, again, that there's something off with the correction factors. Uh, it could also mean that their correction factor at night is different than it is during the day. We see that with a lot of people. They need, a, a more, they need less correction insulin at night to fix their highs than they do during the daytime. Uh, we have a dinner meal where the glucose spiked pretty high before coming back down. You'll notice a correction dose had to be given soon after that dinner dose in order to fix that and to get it down to normal. So I'll usually look at several days to see well, what kind of patterns show up. Is, is there a consistent high or a low after each meal time? Is the glucose overnight stable? Is the system having to fight to keep it stable? that could indicate that the standard basal settings uh, are requiring adjustment. Uh, again, so there's a great deal to learn from these individual reports. But I do start, I like to start out with that macro report. I like to look at the overlay first, just to see where the trouble spots are and where the patient is really doing well. Sometimes we get so hung up on focusing on the problem areas, we fail to acknowledge where we're doing well and let the patient know, hey, overnight, you know, things look great. 
post lunch, wow, you're doing terrific all afternoon. Now, let's see if we can get the evening to look like it does in the afternoon. That'll help you feel and perform better uh, in your day-to-day -day activities. All right, so I think we looked at most of the reports that uh, I tend to go for. If, if you're like me and kind of old school, I, I still like to create a PDF report. If it's a patient who's in the office, I'll print it out and we'll write notes uh, right on that report. So if I wanted to, let's say, do an overlay report, just click on that and create the PDF. If your EMR allows you to save the PDF in the patient file, you've got you know, right there, you've got uh, exactly what you need. So we've got this nice PDF now that's got both the overlay and the AGP below it. It's got some great summary statistics. Uh, it's got all the uh, glucose control metrics over that time period. It makes for a nice printout that we can then write notes on about what adjustments we're gonna make and what types of new teaching uh, methodologies we can use to try to get things even better. So with this patient having 6% uh, of time low in the last week, I think our goal obviously is to cut that down. We wanna get it down 3% at most uh, would be the highest we'd wanna be. So we might apply some strategies to try to work on these lows that were occurring in the afternoon uh, as well as in the evening. Okay. Here, and you can create a multitude of PDF reports all at one time. You don't have to do them piecemeal. I do the overlay because that's just my preferred one, but you can create a logbook, you can print a summary report. And if you want a list of all those daily reports with all the details on them, you can do that as well. It won't jam them all into one little area. It'll do each one individually stacked on top of each other, which is great for analysis purposes. All right, so you know that pretty much summarizes it. Um, get out of here, close that, and uh, we're back again. Uh, because I'm doing a lot more work virtually with patients now, it's great that they can sync their data at home. And when they do so, I can just log into my clinic account and everything is there. I, I, can, I can assign it to their, uh, to their chart. I can, uh, or I can, if they've already downloaded and if they give me their personal login, I can just go in and use that and see everything that's, uh, that's current. It's a very efficient way to work, being able to see data up close. I just got a text message a few hours ago from somebody who had some lows yesterday. And they said they went out to dinner and had some pretty serious lows afterwards. So I was able to go into their Gluco account and see when the lows happened. And it ended up that they were right after dinner, like within an hour. So to me, that's not a bolus dose issue. It was a timing issue because they ate out it's probably a very high fat meal. I think they went to Buffalo Wild Wings or something like that. So I'm thinking, yeah, high fat meal, they needed to extend or delay the bolus for that. That was the answer. And it was because I could go into Gluco and see the data just like that, uh, that we can come to those kind of conclusions. Somebody else might've said, oh, you had all these lows in the evening, let's cut your dinner dose. But that wasn't the issue. It was the timing. And you can see that uh, in these types of reports. So I guess yeah, that concludes. Um, thank you so much for uh, for this obviously fairly quick overview of, of, of things. Um, I know I always learn a ton, uh, even though I've, I've heard you speak multiple times, uh, yet every single time I still learn something new. Um, I know one question that gets asked quite a bit for, um, for folks uh, is obviously a lot of people are using multiple systems, right? They may be going to Clarity, they may be going to T-Connect, et cetera. What, how do you see some of the differences between the different platforms in terms of how they structure their reports, how they make it easy to sort of see the data, et cetera? If you could comment on that, I think that, that would be really helpful. Well, first I have to consider what information do I want? Uh, I need to be able to see device settings. Uh, if I'm only using Clarity, you know, I don't get that. I don't get their pump settings or if it's a smart pen, whatever. Um, I, I always want to see that sensor overlay report and not every program does that. T-Connect does not offer that. CareLink, 
it sort of does and sort of doesn't. You can get it, but it doesn't display very clearly. It's hard to evaluate. Uh, so th those are our key things for me to be able to see the settings uh, and to see the overlay report. And then just from a simplicity standpoint, just being able to get to the reports I need, generate printouts if I want them, PDFs if I want them quickly and easily. Uh, efficiency is key. You gotta be able to get in quickly, get what I need and get out so that I can then work with my patient and, and be able to solve whatever issues are facing them. Makes sense. Perfect. And then one uh, one thing I'll also mention, um, since uh, we're sort of at the end of our of our of our sort of dedicated session here, is of course if you have any questions uh, for Gary or for our customer support team or for any of the account managers, definitely please feel free to raise them, and uh, we'll be happy to sort of address them live or obviously answer it if it, uh, answer it in in text if that's a little bit easier to uh, to to respond back. Um, but I did also want to make make, make a quick note. Um, with the PDF exports that you give to your patients, one of the things that many of you may not know is that there's actually a little QR code down at the bottom. That's actually a great way for them to, to then uh, download and connect their mobile app um, so that they can easily sync their data and all that kind of stuff um, to their main account. And, and there's no sort of confusion as to, okay, what's the right pro connect code or am I downloading and inputting the right information, et cetera. Using that QR code, uh, if you are giving up that PDF handout to your patients uh, after visit, it's a nice little reminder for them to, uh, to easily download the Gluco app and stay connected that way and uh, minimize sort of any kind of confusions or errors that may, may pop up. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to leave it open for just another minute or so to see if there's any sort of last minute questions that anyone's sort of furiously trying to type away and get it in before uh, the end of our time. Um, but I also want to take a quick look at the um, current questions that have already been answered. Uh, I was just want to see if there's anything that came up multiple times. Um, Okay, I think we have most of these questions already answered. I think we're good. All right. Well, perfect. Well, once again, we really want to thank you all for uh, for your attendance today. Really appreciate it and really appreciate the feedback on sort of future topics of interest. Uh, once again, really want to thank Gary for spending the time uh, with us and, and really walking through the various data reports and how he uses them to analyze things and how to better understand what's going on with his patients, make adjustments, and of course, you know, integrate it into a, into the into your daily practice. Um, so, with that, I'd like to thank everyone. We will go ahead and conclude. And then, uh, for those of you, um, uh, I think the I think this was already answered. Uh, you will also get a, a copy of this recording. We will send this once we've had a chance to clean everything up. We'll send a recording uh, of this uh, webinar out to everyone who who registered as well too. So thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day, and we will see you at the next one.